Hello. This is Michael Freund um, from Germany, from Karlsruhe. Um, I'm a professor of physics, um, having worked for a long time in elementary particle physics at the largest colliders of the world, like um, at CERN, at Fermilab in the USA, and um, in Keck in Japan. Uh, and I'm the founder and chief scientist of uh, Blue Yonder, um, a uh, company that uh, does um, AI. We started with projects uh, quite some time ago, and now um, concentrate more and more on building products for uh, retail. Um, I will explain later uh, why retail is a good start. Um, most of the things I'm talking about will be uh, or are uh, much broader, and you can use them for uh, other things um, too. So let's start. Uh, the talk is titled Putting AI into a Leadership. And in leadership, you see also an AI, um, how to innovate and deliver um, lasting value with machine learning. So Blue Yonder uh, is a company um, that consists of about 150 people now and about um, 90 or almost 100 um, uh, are data scientists or machine learning engineers. So it's a very uh, strong uh, group there. Um, and many of them actually come from research centers uh, like CERN or um, universities. Um, our aim is to uh, bring value to our customers through uh, data and software and uh, scientific software and also very scientific way of thinking and solving uh, problems. Um, Blue Yonder has, um, has got quite some recognition. Um, two years ago, for example, we were on the list of the 50 most innovative um, companies of the world by the technology review, and we have won a lot of prizes, like the German Innovation Prize, together with our, one of our customers, uh, Otto, I will talk about later. Um, OK, so how do I see uh, artificial intelligence uh, today? Or the question, what makes machines intelligent? I see there are mainly uh, two branches, um, which are uh, not very different, but slightly different. So the one is the one that I call brute force silicon. This is where Moore's law, so more and more computing power available and affordable, um, helps us very much. And uh, on the software side, especially deep neural networks. Um, here, machines learn things that humans can do easily and well. For example, to see, to uh, recognize objects um, in a picture, in an image, image recognition, to understand text or to understand um, um, a voice, um, what is the contents of it, or also to drive a car, so the autonomous car in that direction also um, I uh, think mainly belongs to this class. So these are things well, um, which are relatively easy and not very um, uh, for a human being, so we can do it without thinking too much. It's more or less automatic, and uh, I also will come back to that uh, soon. Uh, these are tasks which are, for the, for the human, relatively easy, but for a machine, for a computer program, originally very hard to program, and only in recent years there uh, is lots of progress, as I said, mainly due to lots of computing power and uh, especially also to the advent of deep neural networks. On the other hand, um, uh, there are intelligent algorithms, not to say that the others are not intelligent, but here the idea is that one can construct um, algorithms um, that are also affordable in, in terms of computing power um, by applying domain knowledge for concrete problem settings, uh, optimize the algorithm um, and uh, adapt it by machine learning on the basis of observed data or simulated data. So if you want, it's a mixture of our uh, neural networks of uh, humans uh, building it and uh, machine learning um, for doing the, uh, the fine hard work uh, where um, uh, man is not easily possible uh, to do. And with such intelligent algorithms, machines can uh, become, um, also, also here, uh, especially here, they can become better than not only some humans, but uh, even 
than the best uh, human experts. So an example for uh, superhuman uh, performance of computer programs um, is for sure the Japanese um, game Go um, uh, last year um, that won against the world champion. So um, that is really, um, I mean, there also there lots of computing power was needed, um, but uh, that clearly shows that for specific tasks, um, something learned by a machine, of course, including um, good architectures, good ideas, and so on. So there's also lots of human intelligence inside. Um, uh, but a machine then can really uh, become better for a specific tasks uh, than the uh, best humans. And I will give you another example uh, later. So now AI in leadership. What do I mean with that? Um, this, you can interpret the sentence in two ways. First, it is uh, how can we use AI in being a leader, for example, a company leader, um, and I will uh, talk about that. And you can also say that um, AI is already in leadership, and in one, uh, the, oh, an important example where also we are working on uh, primarily that's uh, retail, um, is that you have a very good case. For example, Amazon is the one um, uh, star in, uh, in retail, and it does everything data-driven uh, and uh, with algorithms. And so what one also subsumes today into um, AI. Um, the idea is that uh, leadership or C-level or um, top management can only do some strategic decisions. Um, and the question is then, how can you in, such, in an organization um, break this down to the many or even millions of, of operational decisions that have to, be, uh, have to be taken every day um, so that all these are aligned to the strategic uh, decision or strategic steering from the leadership? And uh, so I give you a few examples how this can be done. For this, you need a holistic process view across departments. So you, one should understand, of course, and also you have access to data from different uh, departments of a company, um, from um, purchase, and you need prices, and you need um, um, uh, <coughs> the uh, selling department, um, and um, all, all data of each single store uh, and of products and uh, of holidays and so on. So it's very important that uh, all the data, all the information that is, um, ex that is necessary for optimizing a complete company is also um, available. Um, and then uh, everything should be data driven. Uh, Predictive and prescriptive analytics uh, will be used, and this will uh, finally lead to decision automation, and that is exactly what I will uh, go through now um, in detail. So um, first I want to talk a bit about uh, decisions. How, does, uh, how do humans uh, make decisions? Um, it is well known um, that most important personal and also professional decisions actually are made by gut feeling, by instinct, by our fast system. And um, I don't want to claim that these can be automated. Um, I talk about something else, um, and that is um, shown on this slide here. Um, I talk about uh, operational decisions um, that are uh, that occur again and again in a similar uh, way, and there are many, many, many of them in, uh, in our daily life. Um, for example, in, in retail, um, there have to be many decisions how to uh, how uh, many to order every day um, from every article in every store, for example. These are many, many such decisions, and they have to be answered every day. And my claim is that. 99-ish percent um, of these decisions can be automated and also to be um, uh, made uh, quite a bit better than um, is done uh, now routinely by, uh, by humans. So I am talking about repeated decisions, not the once-in-a-lifetime decision um, that is, I will explain also later, uh, that is um, really hard to take with scientific methods. But uh, when we have repeated decisions, then we can use a sort of automatic scientific procedure 
to optimize the decisions. Let's go to our example uh, again of a retailer. Um, how many of each of my, let's say, 25,000 uh, items in my store um, uh, uh, should I reorder today and how many of them? Um, what is the optimal price for each of the items? Um, should I um, increase it or decrease it? Uh, or let's say I have um, a data, customer database with some, I don't know, 10 million uh, names in it. Whom of them should I send a catalog so that um, they are um, really um, incentivized to, uh, <laughs> to come into our store and buy something? Um, so these are decisions that are uh, made again and again, and nowadays one has, um, has um, experience and one has probably also um, historical data on uh, such decisions and on the consequences of that. Uh, yeah, that's a funny thing what really happens. So if, um, if there are these routine uh, tasks coming every day and lots of them, uh, then most of the um, most of the time, people actually now in charge of it actually do nothing. Do nothing might also be, okay, we do it exactly like yesterday or exactly like, uh, like last year, but not, uh, not a very sophisticated decision, but uh, just uh, uh, routine as usual and for sure not optimized. Let's say um, about 10% um, of the decisions are taken by following business rules. That's, of course, much better already, but business rules must also be uh, good and they must still be valid. And in markets that change with time, this is also not always um, uh, possible. And I think it's really a very tiny fraction um, of decisions where people really sit down and, uh, and think hard uh, what the best decision would be. For example, if you're a store manager again and your job is to uh, reorder um, uh, let's say apples today, then you might think, ah, but uh, are the apples already fresh? How do they look? What's the price now? What is the competitor uh, prices? How, uh, how many were uh, sold in the last days? Ah, but now the weekend comes and, oh, but we have holidays and there's, a, um, and there's some special day um, on, on Monday and, and so on. So there are many, many influencing, possibly influencing factors like um, ooh, the weather forecast is not very good for tomorrow and, and, and so on. Uh, maybe there's a soccer game uh, in town. So there may be hundreds or thousands of, um, uh, of influencing factors. Uh, and of course, it's very, very hard to... Uh, to, uh, to take all this um, into account. And uh, you can be sure that in daily life, um, this is usually not done. Okay, coming back to um, decision-making um, in the human, uh, scientists have found out in the last 20 years or so how the human brain works. Um, and it, decision, decisions are done by two systems. The first one is a fast, intuitive system, system one, and that uh, about 99% yeah, or even more of our decisions are taken by that. It takes almost no energy to uh, come to a decision with this system. That is what I called automatic in the beginning. So it is done just uh, without really rational uh, thinking. Um, the system two, the slow rational system that only humans have and animals not, that is something which, is, um, which we use much less and uh, which is, uh, costs much energy and we try to not use it. The funny thing is that there have been even um, made many experiments uh, that have shown that most of the decisions, even when we think it has a rational um, uh, reasoning behind it, that the first, uh, the intuitive decision was already taken. And once it's taken, then our slow rational system tries to find the rational answer why our um, or uh, to justify our fast decision. And our fast decision, that is um, something important, um, has many biases. So um, it is, for example, our fast system cannot speak statistics or think sp uh, statistics at all. Um, it's, a, it's always a zero one, um, clearly yes or clearly no. Um, these weighting factors um, and uh, giving arguments uh, for or against, that is something that, um, for example, the system one cannot do very well. Unfortunately, it has been shown that almost all of our 
uh, decisions are system one decisions, even of highly skilled scientists like myself or um, a physician um, or so. It's, um, almost everything is system uh, one and only a very few things are built by the rational system. So um, lots of this you can read uh, about in the uh, book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, um, who describes these things um, uh, very nicely and intuitively. OK, now I come to the alternative. How can we um, uh, try to use more system two and uh, to make even a very good system two uh, rational decisions? And uh, for that, we um, employ predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics. Um, I just want to, um, I will define these names um, um, and the next transparency is a bit better and give examples. Uh, both of these are disciplines of machine learning. And machine learning, again, is a discipline uh, nowadays subsumed into artificial um, intelligence. So predictive analytics means to make predictions from uh, a given data set, from experience from the past. And prescriptive analytics means to uh, give uh, advice um, uh, of uh, uh, external insights and uh, recipes for actions. Um, so the way how decisions um, uh, should be done nowadays in the um, times of data availability and computing availability is first they should be based on data, on objective data, um, and um, uh, <coughs> and not only on on feeling or so, but on uh, on really measured data. Second, we need predictions of what will happen in the near future. Um, then we need uh, a cost or utility function. That is something that we want to achieve. This, we, have, we have to know what we want to uh, achieve. For example, we want to, in a retailer wants uh, to make profit, but also he wants to keep um, his clients, his customers happy. Um, and so the, the final aim is a, is a long-term profit, um, uh, which uh, for sure has a very important component, which is customer satisfaction. Right? Otherwise, you may make profit right now, but he will not come again tomorrow. That's certainly not good. Um, uh, yes, and an optimization. So once we have a prediction, and I will show you how this looks, and we know what we want to um, what we want to achieve, then we can uh, optimize uh, with respect to uh, our um, uh, decisions. So uh, we have to decide now how many to, to buy right now from this article. And uh, for knowing uh, this, we have to really see uh, what is the expected um, utility uh, as a function of my decision that I take now, and then uh, take the optimum of that. And if you do um, all these um, um, four things on lots of similar um, data, then it's also clear that you want to automate. So that is the um, uh, <clears throat> that is a, the recipe, and I go through all the steps right now again. Oh, I'm just seeing there was a question from the audience. Sorry, it's a bit late <laughs> that I look there. Um, please explain holistic process. Yeah. Um, so I said one needs a holistic um, pro. Uh, um, uh, sorry, I mean a holistic view. That means I, I do. So what happens very often in enterprises is there are lots of departments, and each single department might be already quite um, quite optimized. But very often you see that different departments do not share their data. They uh, even have uh, different names for products and so on, or codes. And um, with a holistic view, I mean uh, that it's always good if you com understand a complete process from the beginning to the end and, uh, and uh, have access also to data from uh, different departments because what you finally want to optimize is not um, just the work of one department or of your, your small group, but um, that our view at least is the best can be achieved if you optimize a whole enterprise or a complete supply chain. It might be even across um, enterprises from um, producer via wholesale uh, up to uh, distribution centers and uh, then single shops and, and customer. So um, holistic, um, I mean always it's uh, n not to see it too, um, yeah, too narrow, um, but uh, on, a, on a high level. Our experience is simply the higher the level is, one has access to the larger the 
um, the overall uh, positive effect is. Okay, now when can we use predictive analytics? Uh, we can use predictive analytics. So for that, we have to know, first understand how the world works. Uh, most people think the, um, that the um, world is very deterministic, that we can foresee quite uh, sure what happens tomorrow. That's actually not true. So for you see on the right the pendulum. Uh, there, of course, um, uh, physicists, for example, can exactly calculate what will happen, there, and that's uh, deterministically um, really de uh, predictable. On the other hand, left, you see a lottery. Um, there you can prove that it is not um, predictable at all and it's purely random. Um, so the next time and the next drawing, completely different numbers will be uh, chosen. And there's a continuum of, um, between these with a uh, predictability. And most interesting stuff is actually happening in the middle. So, um, for example, how many uh, of these apples will be sold uh, tomorrow in this, in this shop is something where it's neither deterministic. We cannot say for sure it will be 212 pieces, but it's also not completely random. Of course, we can say something about what will be about and um, what will be the distribution. And that is what uh, I, uh, uh, the, the aim of predictive analytics is to make a probability statement about it. So what can be influencing factors? These can be many. Right, the price, for example, will play a role. Promotion will play a role. Uh, competitive articles will play a role. Competitor prices will play a role. See the season we are in, local holidays, the day of the week, the brand, the weather, the weather forecast for the weekend. All these and maybe others can, uh, can play a role. So there is uh, um, actually quite a lot of influencing factors. And we have many such events uh, um, um, uh, to, to consider. So we have many items in our store, we have many stores, and we have many days. So on a typical um, uh, supermarket chain, for example, we will have something um, like um, uh, 20 million or so uh, um, such data. It's now even much more, uh, yeah, or half a billion uh, such data, um, or many billion uh, such data points uh, where we can to uh, learn uh, learn from. So for me and for beyond a predictive energy, uh, a prediction is not only a number, right? Uh, a number would be just uh, 256 apples, just a number. Um, that is not a good prediction because we don't know anything about the certainty of this. For us, a prediction is really for each of the possible futures, so 250, 251, 252, and so on, but also 200 and 300. What is the probability that this will happen tomorrow? So this gives you a complete curve like, um, uh, like shown here on the right side. Right? So the prediction is a complete so-called conditional probability density function um, for uh, this store, this kind of apple uh, today. Right? So and this, has been, uh, this can be learned from all the historic data that we have um, from, let's say, five years of, uh, five years of, of data from, lots of, uh, from all the articles of a supermarket and, um, and all the uh, stores of a supermarket chain. And if you have the complete probability distribution, then this also allows a complete risk management, and it contains all information, and it... Um, um, uh, and uh, this is something uh, uh, that you really need in order to do a proper uh, optimization. So. Then the next thing is prescriptive analytics. So uh, if you have such a probability curve for every article in every store, this doesn't uh, help the manager uh, yet very much. He has to, to really say, okay, from this I order today, um, uh, 200 um, uh, pieces, right? So he has to do a, a hard decision. And the prescriptive analytics uh, actually uh, delivers this, and the, um, this consists of these two things. First, uh, some sort of utility. Um, uh, there was a question to that I will answer in a minute. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, okay, <laughs> there's another question I will also answer that. Um, um, okay, let's answer this question directly. When Steve Jobs brought the first model of iPhone, did he rely on any of the influencing factors? Uh, no, I would say um, uh, no, uh, because uh, these, what I'm talking is, this is a once-in-a-lifetime decision. 
uh, do I want to bring a new um, product like the iPhone to the market? That's not the decisions I'm talking about. Um, but you can ask now, should uh, a store manager, should he, how many uh, iPhone 6 and 7 should he um, uh, have in a store right now? Uh, thinking about when the next generation comes and so on. That is a um, question we can answer right now. And this is not, not a once in a lifetime, but an again and again um, uh, decision. Um, okay, coming back uh, here, so uh, you, you uh, get, uh, you have a cost when you order, when you don't, uh, when you order too many and for example, you, then you have at least capital cost, but you can um, also, um, uh, if it's a parallel uh, food, then you have uh, the, the chance that you have to throw it away or to, um, uh, to do markdown. Uh, you have cost on that side. And if you have not enough, you have lost sales, at least lost sales and maybe customer dissatisfaction. And this can be coded into uh, a cost function and then the, um, uh, it will be optimized. And finally, the recipe that comes out will be, for example, order um, eight. And if you have many of these things, um, then you have uh, many recipes, then it's also clear that you can um, automate the complete uh, process. So usually every decision is always a compromise between, um, for example, I ordered not enough and I have um, out of stock situations, or I ordered um, too many, then I will have uh, write-offs. So it's um, always a compromise that one is doing. Now with this system here, we can show that um, um, you, instead of this, uh, this decision to be done um, in each single store for every single article every day by humans, um, there will only be um, a, a steered at the um, um, centrally uh, from a strategic team, um, so that decides where on this curve do we want to uh, uh, to be positioned, um, but uh, by doing, by breaking this then down to each single decision with all the influencing factors, so all the distributions look different, all the utility functions are different, uh, you come simply to a much better curve. So that's simple, similar to um, the center portfolio theory, you can uh, become better by aligning uh, thousands or millions of decisions all to the same um, goal. And sometimes it's important to really uh, automate. This is a, pl a real um, plot from a customer here showing um, out of stock in uh, stores um, as a function of time. Uh, we started off with 7.5% out of stock items. That was the original situation. Then the graph shows here the first month was um, where people got the results, the recipes, but it was they still could do what they w wanted, but they had the uh, numbers. And it, it uh, went better, and on average, it was then 5% out of stock. was a bit decreasing with time. And at the, um, where the curve becomes red, actually, this was then completely automated. And you see that uh, then uh, the out-of-stock rate went down by another factor of 10, so huge. This is out-of-stock rate in the German supermarket chain at a constant overall stock level and waste rate. Right, so it, it's not trivial, this thing. It is uh, just showing that the compromise is really uh, much better. And that is something um, that shows that the human decisions are often um, biased. Okay, time is running. I have to speed up a bit. Um, okay, so with the AI, um, AI supply chain in retail, we have um, um, reached about 99% automation rate, less write-offs, less waste more freshness, less capital, less out of stock, more turnover, more efficiency. So that's also very interesting that the introduction of such a system can um, improve lots of different um, uh, numbers simultaneously. One example is Morrison's, where we um, in, uh, introduced an automatic supply chain. Um, so it's the fourth largest uh, supermarket chain in the UK. Um, and uh, this was very successful in uh, reducing um, out of stock and uh, reducing working capital and, um, and re reducing manual intervention needed. Um, and it's uh, actually doing 13 million automatic decisions uh, per day. It led to a reduction of shelf um, um, gaps and an increase in, uh, in sales. Uh, the next page is another thing. It also it makes our customers work smarter. Uh, Morrison then was um, afterwards voted uh, uh, for the uh, store of the week. 
Um, and this is a, what a store manager has said. Uh, new, the new system has made a big difference, not just in terms of maintaining great availability, um, but on the amount of stock we need to keep. They just uh, need to keep stock the back in the back store much, much less. And moral, it's really high in the store. So one of the good uh, consequences of the introduction of this of artificial intelligence was that the store personnel is much more, um, again, on the floor and talking to customers instead of uh, sitting just in front of a screen. Um, we also automated the, um, the supply chain for uh, fresh f food for many customers, for example, for Kaufland, a German uh, uh, supermarket chain. We automated the complete supply chain from uh, production to all the stores uh, and the PO, uh, points of sales, uh, reduced write, uh, write offs and waste, improve availability and freshness, and this whole system made only possible to run. Um, our client to run the most modern meat factory with uh, reduced storage and improved effective shelf life in the uh, point of sale. Another example um, that we are doing is for um, auto predictive shipping. Auto is the largest um, online retailer of fashion and lifestyle products for end consumers in Germany. And what uh, they are also similar to Amazon, they have a huge marketplace with 2 million items, 6,000 brands. And uh, originally they had about five to seven days to deliver. Today, uh, this is of course way too long. So what we are doing is and to predict what will be um, ordered in the next days, and that then will be pre-ordered already from the suppliers um, so that the uh, delivery time to the final clients is reduced to one to two days. And this has uh, increased the KPIs, like increased customer satisfaction, reduction of inventory, lower rate of returns, improvement in shipping, so only also um, uh, just positive and competitive. Price is another very important um, influence on demand, and uh, optimal price setting is also one of the things um, where we uh, build products for. Artificial intelligence pricing in retail also uh, reach 99% automation rate and um, have results with more market share, more turnover, more raw profit, more customers, more new customers. This you do not have because you are too expensive, for sure not. Uh, less returns, zero complaints, and, rest, uh, and less rest at the end of the season. So also there are many uh, usually conflicting um, uh, uh, targets have been uh, achieved simultaneously. Okay, I'll give you now two other examples from my uh, still previous life. As I told you at the beginning, um, I'm originally a physics research professor, uh, professor and researcher, um, and we built such intelligent uh, systems also for physics research. As uh, actually we start, that was where the start was, and only later this was the ideas were uh, transferred to. Uh, companies and into your blue, uh, blue yonder. Um, for example, we tried to, or we did actually, improve or automate a, a large part of the work of 400 world class research physicists from one of the big experiments that is uh, sitting in Japan. Um, 400 um, people working on that for more than 10 years. And um, so what we did is made a meta-analysis of what does a typical scientist in a PhD or as a postdoc, what are they doing with the, in the data analysis? And um, we've seen that more or less it can be um, brought into a process of altogether 72 decisions to be made. And for all of these, we have uh, done this uh, procedure, trained neural networks to, uh, to optimize decisions. Um, and the result of that was um, uh, that about a factor of two more um, um, of the physics events uh, were reconstructed uh, correctly so that they, one could really use them for physics interpretation, interpretation than the 400 physicists in the 10 years together. And this was a work by artificial intelligence and three PhD students, and it corresponds to the output of about 500 normal PhD theses. Uh, it also corresponds to another 10 years of data taking because we had a factor of more than two um, on the uh, efficiency on the same data. And 10 years of data taking, the cost of that on this experiment was 700 million euros. So there is um, really um, uh, a lot of potential and, and, um, and, and gain in using these uh, methods um, strictly. 
Okay, another example uh, also from our company in, in, uh, comp in, in, um, in cooperation with the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology is that we uh, built our prediction machine uh, in hardware so that for the next generation of particle physics experiments, uh, which are really big data experiments, um, there's so much data um, from machines, from sensors is, um, is collected that it's not even uh, possible to read them out into computers anymore. And now we have um, uh, built on an FPGA chip our prediction machine, uh, our uh, decision machine, which is then glued directly onto sensors. Uh, and only those parts of the sensor where the chip decides that it's um, valuable enough uh, to be kept um, are read out by a computer and the rest is shown um, away um, directly. Okay. Um, yeah, what I think will be the uh, future um, or, uh, where AI uh, already del will deliver or delivers already um, real value right now, and, and I'm convinced that this uh, we will have quite a lot of um, uh, of companies like like that. These are vertical end-to-end -end, um, AI solutions. Specialized provi uh, providers combine expertise and experience in solving complicated business problems um, by uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, we do that. Uh, this will uh, be done by combining expert domain knowledge with machine learning and enterprise software uh, expertise to package artificial intelligence into consumable, robust solutions for specific tasks ready to deliver, uh, deliver proven value and competitive advan uh, advantage fast. So actually what we are doing is, to our clients, we hide complexity. So the mathematical details are something that is not really uh, necessary, it's even confusing um, for, um, uh, for some of our customers. So we provide, provide um, the, so this complete as a service. Uh, it's running in the cloud. It's uh, fed, the data is fed from ERP systems, um, from existing ERP systems and the, um, into uh, the cloud, into our system. Uh, that's trained and um, then uh, daily decisions are done. And um, uh, these then are sent back to the client into the ERP system and um, usually after some uh, time um, it is uh, these decisions are then uh, fully automatically um, uh, performed. And Bluyanda certainly is the first mover um, in this area, but I'm convinced that uh, this way of working will, um, will spread quite a bit in the near future. Okay, so um, uh, <coughs> that's um, what I wanted to talk about. And uh, if there are any questions and other questions, I'm delighted to answer them. Thank you very much for your attention. So, what do I have here? Does Blue Yonder have a Bright Talk channel with more webinars that I can check out? Um, up to now, um, not. Um, we have certainly uh, we have lots of um, um, of material out so on our the Blue Yonder website and. Um, and there are also presentations of Blue Yonder can be found on YouTube. Um, I, I think, um, uh, let's say about the Bright Talk channel, we have to think about it and probably can put more there. Are there any other questions? In an ideal world, if all businesses use AI to predict human wants and also the influences, the target audience, by giving limited choices, does it lead to manipulation of the world? Good question. Um, um, yes, if, if one does not do it go, uh, well, then yes. So we are not um, in the area where we do um, um, uh, yeah, personal uh, recommendations. Um, I think, uh, I personally think that it is, um, if, if one p d uh, does personalize um, recommendations too much, it is dangerous for, it is a manipulation of the world and uh, so people will then just see what they anyhow think and uh, not the complete uh, width of the world. Uh, I mean, with all these things, so I think AI is a, is a, is a, is a, is a uh, sharp weapon and we have to use it um, cleverly and, and good and um, should not um, do it um, 
the wrong way. Um, so um, it's a matter of either one one laws also have to be then take or let's say um, we have to uh, to get a consent somehow what should be done and what not. Um, and um, so, as I, I, I think that, oh, but that is, is already now in, in the media and so on, and with news feeds and uh, with um, uh, Google. If, it's, if all the information the, that you get is too personalized, then it's, I see this as a danger. Um, do you use standard software like our SPSS or build your own? Uh, no, this is our own software. Uh, we, as a pro main programming language, we are using Python. Um, uh, under the hood, there's um, some um, Fortran, C, and C++ and parts. Um, but uh, Python, we have uh, seen that Python is a very good language to build systems like that. Um, originally thinking it's uh, not um, not fast enough, but that's wrong. So the, the very good libraries like NumPy, um, uh, which are very fast um, and do, can do um, uh, proper, um, big, also big data handling, and um, also packages now for parallel computing are um, starting to uh, to work so very well, and so on. Uh, so no, it's it's uh, we have our um, own algorithms, uh, proprietary algorithms. Um, and uh, and of course we have um, a lot of experience from our large data science uh, staff, uh, also in what they did, they did before. So many of them were physicists or mathematicians or uh, computer scientists from very different areas of uh, research, but also from companies. Um, Let's see, another question. Did Blue Yonder start as a scientific tool, successfully adapted to the enterprise world or the other way around? No, it's the first. Uh, it's the first way. Actually, so our main algorithm was um, we built for, uh, for uh, physics research, um, for, for particle physics research, where we had big data for a very long time and where we always had the problem to find out from lots of raw data, lots of observation, uh, really, um, let, at the end, um, the, the laws of nature, so the, the rules behind it, the extraction of, um, and also of very um, effects which are not very, um, of very rare effects. We have to get information from the data, and it has to be, it has to be correct, because in physics, if you uh, then publish something which is not correct, then um, that's not very good for your career, so it should be correct. But if you're always too conservative, then you will never observe something as a first um, 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 <clears throat> as a first scientist because all the others are faster. So that's why we are very good in finding in, in uh, finding uh, fastly uh, effects, but which are really statistically significant. How frequently should the AI models given used in a given situation need to be recalibrated? This depends very often. It's uh, not pos uh, not necessary to do a recalibration very often. Once, if all um, uh, all the actual numbers are uh, are put in. Um, so, for example, if you need um, a, a stock level, then it must be the actual stock level. But this you have to have. But a real the training of the process can be uh, much much less. Um, once a week or for some things over once a month is for sure good enough um, for that. So I think um, the time will be over in a few seconds. Uh, if there's another question, then please, otherwise I already say uh, goodbye. I thank you very much for your um, attention and please um, have a look uh, at our uh, web page where you can find more or yeah, look also at some presentations uh, you can find on YouTube. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I just got three feedbacks up to now and they are all uh, positive. Thank you very much for that.